anybody who wants to sit inside and hear about birds is being very kind today. Um, I am going to talk about, I, I focus on swallows in my research and my work and as a hobby. So the thrust of my talk is you'll get a lot of bad news because these birds are, most of them are declining. But then we'll talk about what we can do to help them. So the first bird I'm going to talk about today uh, is bobolink. And are any of you familiar with bobolinks? Probably most of you. So this is definitely, I'm saying starting big because bobolinks require at least 20 acres. I mean, it's not that one couldn't show up in a smaller area, but you generally find them in hay fields that are over 20 acres. Um, and that's the, the less edge there is to that area, the more bobolinks you'll tend to have and the more attracted they'll be to the field. So I love this. This is part of an Emily Dickinson poem, and it kind of, if you've ever heard a bobolink, you'll kind of understand that uh, part of the poem. They're kind of swaggery. They're loud. They're in the blackbird family. Um, black, it, most of you are probably familiar with red-winged blackbirds. Very loud. Orioles are in that family, and bobolinks and grackles, um, and so they're very um, dimorphic in terms of the sexes, the females on the left, the males on the right. So they're a declining species, and their history in the country is, um, we tend to think in kind of short scales, even when we think we're thinking long term, that's what I've learned. I've always thought, oh well, they're a prairie bird, and when the prairies were destroyed in the Midwest, and we cleared all the land here in New England, they moved here and started breeding here. And that's true, but they probably always have bred here because geologically, when we go back like to the last ice age, say, there were open areas, and that's kind of gonna be a theme, and it's a part of a theme of why I kind of advocate for these open area, meadow land, hay field type birds. It's not just agriculture that created those. Though there were openings for these birds throughout history. We can't just look at the last 150 years. Evolution's been going on for millions of years. So um, in any case, the prairies have been um, pretty degraded in the Midwest, and hay fields were created in the 1800s, and they did expand to, be, to nest here, because we previously did, were forested pre 1700s, 1800s. So you can see um, that's a pretty big decline, 65%. That's the breeding birds that are bay, which is what I refer to for my data for the. There's a lot of reasons there probably for their decline. I mean, on a migration that long, there's weather events. They're actually, they eat rice. They're called rice birds in South America. And they actually are shot and killed because they're, pet, they're pests in South America. Um, so they don't have the Migratory Bird Act. Um, uh, they're also caught because they sing nicely and they're caged. Um, so it's a different scene down there than here in terms of what you can <coughs> do and can't do with birds. <coughs> but here, their biggest problem is once they find a hay field, they, so I should go back, they nest. Um, you won't find them nesting in shrublands or woodlands or like I said, on their lawn because it's too, that's too small an open area. They need hay, they tend to go in hay fields that are over 20 acres. So, um, but what happens when they do that, because they nest right in the grass, on the ground, is they get mowed in June, because that's when the best hay is available. So they can try to re-nest, but they usually get mowed again. This is a farm in Shelburne. I, it's a property I, I own that has bobolinks, and we just sold it to Mass Audubon, and we're just praying that they keep mowing. So again, another thing to note, um, it's kind of ironic because the, the haying destroys their nests, but yet it also creates the hay they like. Different conservation organizations are trying to come up with regimes that create the good hay that's not full of weeds or uh, alfalfa and has more of the grasses and the broadleaf plants like dandelions and alfalfa that they can that they like. So that's a bobolink nest. Uh, literally, it's on the ground in the middle of the field. And it's really hard to tell where they are because the parents will kind of do this sneak thing where they land far from their nest and walk on the ground. Right now, bobolinks, they just arrived, so the males come before the females. So if you want to see bobolinks now, you can. The males are here and calling for females, and 
they don't have chicks yet, but they will in about two, three weeks. So that's, that's what the chicks look like. So here's the trend map. Um, this is the, again, breeding bird survey data, 1966. Unfortunately, it's kind of outdated. Time goes by. I'm like, oh, 2012 is not that long ago, but it really is long ago. But the trend hasn't improved. Um, so this is where they were increasing through that time period. This is just a broad description of this map. And this is where they were de decreasing, declining. So they're declining in our area. There's some increases where the blue is. If, what do we want to do for bobolinks? Even though you may not have a field with bobolinks, or you might not even know anyone who has a field, there may be town, you might have town properties, or you can advocate if you hear about a field or you see a field, you can talk to the farmer. I mean, I'm all, farmers need to make money, and we rely on farmers. Um, so it's a really hard problem. But there are some things you can do to be able to mow and accommodate the bobolinks. So if you want prime hay, it doesn't work. In large and huge fields, you can like mow one section a year and leave them, and mow it enough that they can never get established, and then leave them the rest of the field and change areas each year. That's one strategy. Um, if you're just like, I love birds, whatever, I'm just gonna do what I, which is what I'm doing, which, because I don't have animals to feed, you have to mow after August 1st. And even with that, it tends, and you got to take the hay off. And even when that happens, the, it over time it degrades because it grows in with weeds and golden up. And so then, the third year, you want to do an early mowing before they've really gotten established. They may be here, like right now, and then you have to wait 65 days. So I'm just giving you some information here. This is. Um, if you're interested, the Bobbling Project is a website that they actually pay, it's a program where they pay farmers not to mow in June. So try to make up for what they lo would lose. Um, so the next bird is the kestrel. So a lot of these birds overlap in terms of what they, the habitat they need. So a bobolink doesn't need, need a field that big, but like say at Patton Hill where I just had the picture there, there's ke there are kestrels nesting there along with bobolinks because kestrels use open areas. They just don't need them to be that big and they have a few other requirements. So they're a falcon, just to give you a little back background, the smallest falcon that breeds in North America. So they're related to peregrine falcons, but much smaller, definitely not as fast. And here is their breeding range. They're, the, the year round is purple, so we they're just south of us um, in the winter, but. If, it depends on the weather, but you can see they have sort of a, they're less of a strict neotropical migrant. In fact, they aren't really. Breeding season in year round is purple and the breeding season is red. So they nest in, naturally they nest in cavities that they don't, they can't excavate. So they rely on like an old, an owl, a woodpecker hole or, you know, a cavity when a snag breaks off in some, you know, even, uh, they, they might use a large hole that um, screech owl, they tend to use the same size hole. They feed crickets, grasshoppers, snakes. They're very actually, they have a wide range of areas they will nest and a wide range of things they will eat. So I guess you could say adaptable, but within certain parameters. So you usually see them in fields that are bigger than 60 acres. That's not to say there's always exceptions to the rule. So, um, but, um, they need low vegetation to find their prey, and then snags for nesting, or that's my kestrel box, and kestrels do nest in it. So they're declining, so 50%, again, more bad news. The reason, so they, they need our help. So Drew Vitz, the state ornithologist, and he won't mind me telling you this, if you have good habitat for kestrels, he'll give you a box. So you just have to know what good habitat is, so I'm gonna try to, try to explain it. They, they tend to um, be, so this is a hay field, but it's very wet in front of that box, so that stays low. So, it, you know, if nothing's cut and dried. They're, my bobolinks are in a hay field. Um, you can find them in pastures. So one thing that has caused them to decline is that you go from something like the upper picture, which is what farms more used to look like, to the lower, which is, <coughs> The lower right is a field that 
was once a farm and is not very helpful for kestrels. And then this large scale agriculture, which is the opposite of what you see on the top photo. So kestrel um, boxes are, they do have a shortage of um, nesting cavities because of just more forestry and less old growth on the edges of fields. So boxes are good. So for kestrels, again, like leaf snags, you don't have to cut everything dead down um, on the edge of the field. Cats are terrible for all birds. Just cut, I love cats, but they're just decimate wild bird populations. That and window hits. Don't use pesticides and rodenticides if you don't have to, especially rodenticides for birds of prey because uh, they'll eat the, the mice or whatever you're trying to poison and then they get the same poison. And that's a really common way that they die and end up at wildlife rehabbers and then putting up nesting boxes. So swallows are my thing and Janet was like, don't just talk about swallows. <laughs> but, um, and that would be my inclination because I feel more comfortable because I've spent more time with them. Um, this is a barn swallow, so um, you can see it's a beautiful bird. It's not to scale with the, like the kestrel was smaller than the barn swallow. I'm sure you know that's not the case at all. That barn swallow, is they're quite small and they're very aerodynamic and they have really short feet because they barely ever walk. This is a barn swallow nest, so they make a, ne a nest out of um, mud. So they're common on farms. They use open, they forage in open areas on insects. They use mud, which they get, you know, it's plentiful on farms. Plus farms tend to have a lot of insects because they have livestock and manure. This is the breeding range of the barn swallow in North America. So they're, um, just be aware on the, this kind of map. I always want, I, I always have to remind myself, that blue of where they winter is where, that encompasses everywhere they've ever been seen. But it's not like they're all over there all the time. It makes it like, oh, there's barn swallows all over South America. It's that just encompasses, they've been seen everywhere in South America in the winter. Um, and the red is where they nest. Um, so. They're, they actually have a huge range worldwide. These are different subspecies, but this is kind of interesting. Barn swallows, of all the species I'm talking about today, nest on every, almost every continent. I mean, you can see just how wide their range is. Um, but they are declining in every part of their range, unfortunately. This is a summer distribution map, so it is, again, I, it only goes till 2010, but it's general, generally true that there are more dense populations in the eastern part of the country. They also have declined, actually, aerial insectivores, so birds that catch insects while in flight. So that's um, swallows, swifts, flycatchers, and nightjars, so things like whippoorwills. They are declining faster their decline is steeper than any other bird in North America right now. And it, no one really knows why. Um, it seems like it might have to do with insects, but it's not clear how, um, because studies show things like they're being fed the same amount of food that they always have. So it's looking like it's the, the food quality is lower that they're getting. It, things in nature are never as simple as we would hope they are. They're just not. And there are other threats like the climate change when they travel south in the fall, there's always hur seem to be hurricanes. Um, there are lots of pesticides used in South America where they winter that we don't use here. Um, so we don't really know why they're declining, but they've been declining since the 60s, but really more severely since the 80s. So here's my line for the aerial insectivores. It's the pink line. And it doesn't mean that every bird and every, every species in all those groups, each of those groups is declining just as a group. They have the highest percentage of species that are declining, especially swallows and swifts. Timmy swifts is probably the one you're familiar with. So this is the breeding bird atlas that Mass Audubon does. And the way this survey works is the darkest areas on this map are where barn swallows were confirmed breeding from 19, the range, is, it's in the 70s, so long ago, uh, longer ago than, I'm going to compare it to a more recent one. I can't, I can't remember the range. It's like 71 to, I can't remember, it's the 70s though. So you can see confirmed is the dark 
green. Mm -hmm. Probable is the, the next lightest, then possible, and then not found. So then in the next survey, I should have the date here. This was in the 90s, late 80s, 90s. You can see it's not, they're still covering the same area, but it's less confirmed breeding. So in Massachusetts, this is, this is sort of the thing, you'll still see them, but it looks like they're just not breeding all the places that you might be seeing. The people are seeing them and reporting them, but not confirming nesting. So this is also, this declining habitat for barn swallow section actually could apply to all the species I'm talking about. There's a stray cat. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> um, so this shows the same very place in Petersham, Massachusetts in 1880 versus 2010. So obviously land use has changed and for birds that rely on open areas, there is loss of habitat. It's just unequivocal. Um, that doesn't mean that it's bad because other birds like certain types of warblers and woodland species love the stuff on the right. So we're just talking about barn swallows and um, the, the open field and meadow species. The other thing is that farming has declined. So this barn in Shelburne used to have barn swallows and cliff swallows and it's like not there, fell down. A lot of barns are coming down. Wetlands are you know, we've been filling wetlands for years, just losing wetlands, and the, especially swallows, um, when they arrive in the spring, they feed on, they, they're strict insectivores, so they, when it's cool, they tend to congregate over water bodies, because that's where they can find insects. So people, historically, they used to think, before we discovered that they migrate, people thought they wintered in ponds, because they just seemed to come out. <laughs> over ponds in the spring. Yeah, kind of interesting. So the problem for barn swallows, number one, is that even when people have barns, if they stop farming and sell it or get to use it for something else, the windows close. It's just very simple. This barn in Williamsburg had about a dozen to 15 pairs of barn swallows nesting, and they always used the upper windows. This farm it's actually the Graves Farm, and it was written up in a book called Birds of the Connecticut Valley in Massachusetts. That's kind of a seminal book on birds in Massachusetts. It's actually really good reading because it's very old-fashioned narrative-y. And this place was called a swallow mecca. And so there were barns. This is after most of the farm had <coughs> been dismantled because Mass Audubon bought it and doesn't like buildings. The owner, the person who bought the farm, fixed the barn up, which like it was seemed to most people was great, but the barn swallows were gone. Like even if they had opened one window halfway it makes a it made a huge difference, but they didn't want them in there. Is that the only place they'll nest in a barn? So this is what I this is I was just gonna talk about that. So because I get that question a lot because it's kinda like, well, they were here us, you know, what did they do before humans? Mm -hmm. Like maybe we're just going back to natural population levels. Mm -hmm. But like I said First of all, it hasn't always been forested here historically, while well, barn swallows have been here. And second of all, there's new research showing that barn swallows in particular, um, someone, a woman in um, Colorado did a study, and I, I'm not a good geneticist, um, but she did like DNA, DNA analysis seeds on all the different subspecies, and she somehow was able to figure out that they evolved, they had like a founder event, which in evolution means there was a small population and then they found um, there was a change in the habitat that caused the population to explode and for them it was human settlements. And they were here on Indian, you know, Native American settlements. Um, and they also nested, it's thought, in caves, but really they're completely associated with humans and have been for a long time. So to answer your question, yes, I mean, I've never, I've been looking at barn swallows for 30 years and I've never seen one on a natural, in a natural place. We so, got some nesting in the basement of our barn just because I left the door open uh, like a bunch of times and I didn't really, you know, want them in there. But now I'm thinking maybe I should just see that. Well, it's up to you, you know. I mean, if you don't want them, I'd keep it closed all the time because yeah, they'll keep trying, you know. Uh -huh. You know, but, um, they are, 
they're really dependent on um, on us. And I, you know, I understand not everyone can accommodate it, um, but when you can, it's a good thing. Um, another thing is climate change. So I got a call from a woman um, in. Georgia who always had barn swallows and they nested in her barn and it had a metal roof and she said that the swallow the chicks got so hot they were jumping out of the nest because she thought they were too hot and they were too hot and I because I've seen it when they get too hot they tend to like to be near the ceiling they just bail out so she hung them in a basket mm -hmm. and it actually worked the parents fed them but that's not something we can do every day for barn swallows. So, <laughs> but it is a problem, and it is a problem for cliff swallows too now, mm -hmm. under metal roofs. Another thing is just pesticides, and this is something I've been trying to learn about, and there's so much information, and it's so confusing, because like nothing seems to be the one thing that is causing the problem. Like, there are studies showing that neonicotinoids that are, you know, that are affecting bees are affecting swallows, but swallows have been declining long before that pesticide was in use. Um, but um, surveys are showing that there are fewer insects worldwide. There have there have been a lot of studies done in Europe, some in South America, very few in North America. But in Europe, there have been studies showing that there's just fewer insects around. And if that's what they're eating, they're just getting less food or a different quality food. Um, that's the other thing is if, if they're relying on insects that hatch at a certain time and they've evolved to get here when those insects are hatching or when they're young or growing and they can't get them, it's a problem. So I'm now I'll get into the things you can do, which are things I do and I found work for cliff swallows and barn swallows. I'm not talking about cliff swallows today because they're just so rare that I don't think any of you have them or I would know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they do almost did. <laughs> you had them for a minute. <laughs> Long story. But anyway, so I, I won't go into all the research, my history with swallows, but suffice to say that I have discovered that if you create mud for them, if you are trying to attract them and you don't have a farm and you've just decided you want swallows, they are attracted to mud. That's a puddle at Graves Farm, that's a puddle at Graves Farm, and that's a puddle at Shelburne. And I actually enjoy having a puddle. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, the birds bathe in it. I get frogs. And it, it's, it's kind of nice. And the birds just love it. And it's fun to watch them come and use it, because you can see them come and use it. I don't know if this will work. It's a little movie of, of a barn, just to prove the, how much, you know, it, they, <laughs> yeah. And you can hear cliff swells in the background because it's the recording that I play was, was playing to try to attract them, so that's not very helpful, but there they all have coming in. This is what they're doing right now at my barn because it's that time of year. Could you step back a little bit? Oh, yeah. You see how short their legs are. I don't know, maybe I should stop this. <laughs> <laughs> so are they eating or? No, it's picking, he's, he's, I think it's a he, is it a she? Actually, maybe it's a she. It, it was picking up grass. Their, their nests are made of grass and mud. So they pick up the grass and then they get mud to sort of pack it together, like they're a little adobe. So, you can also open doors and windows. I've literally had people say, oh, my barn swallows aren't here, and, and they've shut their barn, and they didn't know. That. <laughs> I, I don't know how, but you know, you need to keep it open, and the more openings, the better. Even though, but if you, you know, if you don't want all your windows open because you're worried about rain, then open as many as you're willing. But the more openings that they have, the more you're likely to get more. Um, I've opened, I've progressively opened more and more of this barn, and I've gotten more. Um, I don't know if that's the entire reason. And you can put signs up that say, don't shut it. Mm -hmm. Do not shut this door. So this is Conway, and it's interesting. Barn swallows, I focused a, m most of my time with, on cliff swallows, and they're really straightforward to me. They like to build nests under eaves. They're very colonial. They're pretty predictable. Barn swallows are very unpredictable. 
Um, so this, these are two barns in Conway. That one is probably, I don't know, like an eighth of the size of that one. And it's got like 20, uh, 15 pairs of barn swallows in it. And that one has none. But that one has horses. <coughs> they do seem to really like horses um, or to be attracted to farms that have horses. Um, the other thing, though, is that Janet has a barn about that big, and she has one nest, and she has horses. Well, I'm going to have more nests. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just kind of confusing to me. That just doesn't help me understand them. But they've been, she's had them for 10 or 15 years. So yeah. the, the increase as far as all their generations are coming back. I think that is, that's a lot of it. Well, um, you, they actually, the, the adults are will return to the site that they last nested, but the young dispersed, so her young should be going to your house. <laughs> um, so this barn is, um, there's a guy in Shelburne who got bought some land that had this barn and he decided he wanted to attract swallows, which this is rare. And um, this is in, Chapel Falls is Ashfield, right? Yes. Yeah. It's near there, um, but I was like, I don't think you should put those slats up at all. But he did, and it's fine, and there are barn swallows nesting in there. Um, that's like somebody who has some money <laughs> to spend can do this. But hey, if someone with money wants to do that, it's good. It's, it's really just for the swallows. It's kind of amazing. This is brand new to me. Oh, so old nests attract swallows. It's actually the most, when they return to a site, the cue for them that it's a good site is the presence of old nests. That's their cue. So they also use artificial nests and I make artificial nests for them. I was trying to attract both barn swallows and cliff swallows to places where they didn't nest and I decided not to do that because I think that they're choosing sites based on things other than there being a nest there. So I didn't want to trick them and like create a sink population, which I think I did it. Patton Hill where I do my, my work because they never nested there and I attracted them by putting up artificial nests and making a mud puddle and they were like, oh, this must be good. And they did okay, but they only stayed for a couple of years. So I just thought, you know, we'll just work on building up colonies that, you know, existing colonies. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, like probably you sort of have a, a season for the nesting. Do barn swallows have the same thing? The, the, yeah, they, they arrive here, it's, yeah, it's about the same. Barn swallows get here a little before bobolinks, <coughs> and both species leave in September. Yeah, they're, they So build the barn before a certain date. Right, you don't have to have it open all year. So if you open it, if you open it like, I don't know, third week of April, and then just you can see when the last ones leave. The barn swallows have two broods, so sometimes they're here later than. These are two of my artificial nests that barn swallows used. One is on, the one on the left is at my barn, that one is Janet's. Um, so they do, they do use them. And, it, and that's a weird one that they're using this year. I'm trying different locations. This is a location they used, but I never tried to make an artificial nest. That what is that made of? So it's clay, it's ceramic clay, and then it's bisque fired. So it's, it's durable for um, forever, really. It's like dishes that haven't been glazed. So this is that, I mean, you know, some people just think of them as pests, but they're very cheerful to have around. A lot of farmers like them. I just find people enjoy them. They're like, they come in the spring, they make a lot of noise, they swoop and fly faster than any other, you know, not faster, but the aerodynamic nature. And that's cute, they're cute. That's, that's a little fledgling at my barn. And then here's just to show when I arrived at the barn that you saw the picture of, it was closed, except for there was an open um, horse barn area where there was one nest, one nesting pair. And you can see just with the mud, and I hadn't even put up artificial nests until, not till 2012. Oh, I, yeah, so pretty much right away. Opening the door, opening the windows, creating a mud source. Um, that alone brought in, you can see that this goes all the way to last year. It's increased. It leveled off for a while, it dipped in 2016, but overall the trend is up. So even though they're declining in the Northeast, you can make a difference. Oh, there's some weird things that happen, like I have cliff swallows and I had, I had barn swallows nesting 
and then like all the cliff swallows covered every barn swallow nest. Uh, and it was very disturbing to the barn swallows. I just made a silly slide. <laughs> and then this is what you have, this is like the pile of droppings left at the end of the year. Wow. <laughs> so just to show you, because it's reality, people don't want them in certain areas, but I have to say, you can, you can also put something down like newspaper and carry it away. Um, it doesn't really, it's really not bad. It's, it's, no. People love dogs and it's much better than yours. <laughs> <laughs> if you put a pile of hay or, or shavings underneath where they poop, they always poop in the same place. Mm -hmm. then yeah, the young, when they shovel yeah. it up. Mm -hmm. When the young get to be yeah. a certain age, they then go they start out the back. and out and drop the poop wherever. They yeah. just go out the back, yeah, the nest. Yeah. That's when it really builds up. Yeah. It's, it's really only, it builds up during the last two weeks yeah. that the young are in the nest. Yeah. They're the last week, yeah, week and a half. And you might get a Phoebe, so Phoebes are good too, and that's a Phoebe in my barn. Not that Phoebe, but the nest. Now in your barn, my barn swallows hate other birds in the barn, and they chase them out. They won't allow them in now. Oh, really? The yeah. Phoebes? No, yeah, they won't allow uh, the barn, um, well, they hate the starlings. They go after the starlings. They just don't want other birds. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but the, um, uh, sparrows, barn sparrows, they, they double out. Well, the house sparrows, this. house sparrows are really kind of rough on swallows. Uh, yeah. yeah, the house sparrows I'm going to talk about a little bit. They're, they're not, they're terrible on cliff swallows because they're yeah. cavity nesters. Right. I know people have trouble with uh, house sparrows in the, with their barn, in their barn swallow colonies. Yeah. But I haven't had that. Uh, but, because, yeah, house sparrows are cavity nesters, but they might be actually, if the barn swallows are freaking out, the house sparrows were probably doing something bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So tree swallows are another species that uses the, it's common in our open areas, meadows, fields. They're very closely related to barn swallows, but they're in a completely different habitat. They nest outside in a nest, before there were nest boxes, in snags, like a kestrel, in a cavity. They don't excavate their own cavity. so. They've really adapted to nest boxes, and this one here is obviously standing on one. And Here's and they their open space too, though. They yeah, yeah, they do. Every bird in this top they does. Need their metal yeah, metal. yeah, yeah. everyone. And each and every each one migrates south for the winter, except for the. Even, you won't see kestrels here. The only one you'll see, I'll talk about bluebirds in a little bit. They stay. Um, so tree swallows have a little bit broader nesting range across North America. This is the red is where they nest. They can survive colder temperatures because they actually eat berries. They will eat myrtle and bayberry. Is bayberry myrtle? Is it the same thing? I don't know, but they do. So uh, they've also declined, especially in Canada. There's a lot of research being done on tree swallows in Canada. In Canada, the aerial insectivorous species are in steep declines. Barn swallow is listed as threatened in Canada. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of surprising. It's listed as endangered in Nova Scotia and threatened in Ontario. So that's kind of extreme. But anyway, tree swallows, there's a lot of research going on on tree swallows in Canada and as to why they're declining. They naturally nest in cavities. Here's one, and they're usually near wetlands. Like you'll see the dead snags in the marshes. That's a really common place for them. The male and female look alike. The, the females tend to be a little browner, especially if it's their first year. It takes them two years to get really blue on the back, the females, but they're the same size. So tree swallows, like I was talking about, the, they seem to rely on these insects that we don't really think about. It. We just think insects, but some insects have terrestrial larval stages and some have aquatic larval stages. And the aquatic larval stage insects, aside from dragonflies, have different nutrients, these certain omega fatty acids that seem to be important to swallows. It seems to be something that is affecting tree swallows because climate change is causing these aquatic larval species to hatch out like mayflies earlier than they normally would and last shorter so that when the tree swallows are feeding their young, they're not available. They also tend to be around wetlands, so they tend to get, they have more, in, when they, um, the research that's been done on the contaminants in their blood, they have higher levels than other swallows. 
Um, and they have been proved to be negatively affected by neonicotinoids. Because neo neonicotinoids are applied, they're a systemic pest insecticide, and, but the plant only takes up 10%, 90% washes off into the wetland, you know, gets in the wetlands. So it's really not, it's really actually not as targeted as some might think. So there's a bar barn swallows are super aerodynamic and use boxes. So if you put up boxes for bluebirds, you could get tree swallows. It's six, you get either or. And their nests do look different. That's a tree swallow nest. Tree swallow nests tend to be a little lower, a little sloppier, and they always have lots of feathers in them. And actually, when you're checking boxes, sometimes the females are really bold. They won't fly out when you open it, open the box. It's interesting. And they'll dive bomb. They dive bomb every time I go into the garden. Yes, they're. They, our box is right at the end of my garden, and. Yes, they're aggressive. They're pretty aggressive. Yes, and they'll they'll call they'll 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 nick your head. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of talking about bluebirds and tree swallows together. They're completely different in, in terms of their lineage. They're not swallows are not related to bluebirds, but they both use bluebird boxes in open meadows. Bluebirds. This is just male, female, and then the juvenile. They're thrushes, and the juvenile stage kind of um, like a robin. They're very speckly. They look like a hermit. You know, they're related to hermit thrushes. It's kind of interesting. Um, and everybody loves bluebirds. You don't have to convince anybody. They're like the popular bird, and they're actually doing better because of the conservation efforts that have been put. But they're like the charismatic species. They've gotten more attention, which is good. Their breeding range and their wintering and breeding. They're here. You can find them in the valley in the winter. They eat sumac. They really don't. Robin is not the first sign of spring anymore, and bluebirds are around in the winter. So they also, like tree, like tree swallows, use snags um, and don't excavate them, so rely on existing ones. And they're also, they're increasing. They're not an aerial insectivore, so they're not having those particular issues. And like I said, I think all the efforts that have been put toward them in terms of bluebird trails and awareness has helped. And people people will like get rid of house sparrows for bluebirds, but not for tree swallows or wrens. You know what I mean? It's They just are the bluebird of happiness. <laughs> and they are. I mean, so that box that you see there, I'm not giving dimensions or any of that. You can get all that information really easily. It's the same box you'd use for a tree swallow and you'd use for a bluebird. A difference between their, the bluebird nests tend to be more um, form, deeper, have more pine needles in them, and they're just more cup-like. But you can pretty much tell who's sitting on the box more, which, what, whose nest it is. But one really big difference between bluebirds and tree swallows is bluebirds feed on the ground. They like perches and they catch insects on the short grass. A big hay field, a hay field with a box in the middle would be harder for a bluebird to hunt. Like they might start nesting in the spring and then it grows up and they'd probably go hunt somewhere where there's short grass. Whereas tree swallows just catch insects on the fly so they don't, I had a tree swallow box last year with grass up to the opening. Like it didn't matter. They were just, they just, they feed in the air. So if you is it a difference if you put it, the bluebird box on a pole as opposed to um, attach it to a tree? I think it's safer. I think I mean it sounds crazy because they nest in snags, but I think that if you're really trying to do everything you can to mm -hmm. give them the best chance, mm -hmm. if you have it on a tree, it's more likely that a raccoon or something could crawl in and mm -hmm. reach in, and so some people put like PVC on their put on their. Um, on the poles or baffles, um, there's different things you can do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So house sparrows, that's a female house sparrow in a cliff swallow mm -hmm. nest, but that was the picture, mm -hmm. photograph I had. House sparrows are the ones that you see t generally in like Northampton, downtown Northampton, Cumberland Farms, nesting behind signs. Mm -hmm. uh, eating bugs out of people's grills <laughs> um, <laughs> in the parking lot. Just kind of amazing, um, but there are European species that was brought over here for pest control in the mid 1800s. That's the male. They just are very aggressive, and they outcompete all of our cavity nesters when it comes to nesting. They just are more aggressive, and they don't. 
problem with them is, especially for like in a cliff swallow colony where there are many birds nesting in a colony, is they don't take, they'll take over one nest and then they defend a broad zone on either side of the nest they're using and dump everything out. Chicks, eggs, adults, just get rid of it. So that's the male and, you know, if they nest in bluebird boxes, not always. I mean, you tend to find them more near towns or near farms. That's where you tend to find them. And their nest is, they're actually a weaver finch, and their nest is very different from a tree swallow or a bluebird. It's like, it's got grass like woven over it, sort of as a roof. They usually have feathers mixed in and trash and whatever they find. <laughs> what, what were they brought in to get rid of? They were, people think they were like, I think there's a story that they were brought in because they were mentioned in Shakespeare, but it's not, that's not the case. They were brought for pest control. A starling, yeah. Potato beetles. Oh, potato beetles. So, but they, they, that was 1850 and by the, it only took a couple decades for them to completely spread out and start affecting other cavity nesters. So if you want to know more about swallows, you should contact me. I'm very interested in all the species I talked about today, but I tend to focus on swallows. There might be people in here who know more than I do even about bluebirds, but I am trying to get people to just become more aware of agricultural and open meadow habitats. Um, there's a whole other habitat, which is shrublands, that I'm not an expert on, but um, you know, it just, many of these species are, except for the bluebird, are all declining, and a lot of species are, so whatever we can do to help. And I'm here to help if anybody wants to help swallows ask questions. Um, so that's all I've got today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it.